Welcome to Discovering. Lake sturgeon travel upstream to spawn. We'll take a look at how they get past barriers such as this. They need a little bit of help, so that's where we come in uh, with this fish ladder. It's all right here, right now, on tonight's edition of Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. One of the more unique fish in our waters is the lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon are the only sturgeon species common to the Great Lakes Basin. Adult sturgeon habitually return to spawn in the streams where they were born, often migrating long distances up rivers to get there. But what happens when they can't get there due to some man-made barrier? Well, you build an engineering marvel like no other found in the entire country. We were nominated and um, received a uh, national award from the uh, American Council of Engineering Companies. Klein Schmidt Associates and Eagle Creek received one of 12 awards given to civil engineering projects throughout the country. This design for a fish lift designed specifically for lake sturgeon is the, uh, the only one in North America. Uh, so we're very proud to have that here on the Menominee River. When you think of like a fish bypass, you think out west, like the salmon, the, the ladders, they're trying to get past those dams. Uh, the, the, the lake sturgeon are a little bit different. Um, they're not as strong and fit. They can't uh, just, you know, swim over anything. They're bottom feeders, so they're not going to, to act like the, the salmon do. So they need a little bit of help. So that's where we come in uh, with this fish ladder. So um, the basic premise of this lift is um, to attract fish towards um, the current. So um, right now it's running at 40 cubic feet per second, but we can go as high as 120 cubic feet per second. And um, lake sturgeon and other species are attracted, it's called a flow attraction, um, they're attracted to the fish lift. So then they'll come in here and um, they'll swim around trying to look for another hole. They're not going to find one, they're just going to get a dead end. Uh, we close the lift and then they're contained in that hopper. So uh, once the, the gate is down, we lift up uh, the hopper and then we sort out the fish that we catch. So right now we have um, current going through the lift. It's at 40 cubic feet per second. And you see right now the gate is going down. So we're closing the fish lift. So it contains whatever fish that have been caught in here. And uh, Jake is gonna lift up the gate slowly. It takes a few minutes and then it'll pour into the sorting tank up top here. A lot of times you'll see it about halfway up. You'll be able to see a sturgeon swimming in there or um, a Chinook salmon. Um, and that looks like a walleye. It's really cool to, to work both um, the spring season and the fall season because you get um, the, the pulse of the river. You'll, you'll get walleye coming in in the spring. You get the suckers, the, um, the northern pike. Um, and then, you know, in the fall, uh, we'll get the schnooks in. And of course, you know, in both season, we get our lake sturgeon. So it's really cool to see whatever fish comes up. You know, another added benefit of this fish lift is not only um, moving the lake sturgeon above these dams, but also taking biological data of the fish that get caught in here. So um, we'll be able to take aging structures for walleye that come in here to see how they're uh, growing in the system. Um, we have a lot of data on largemouth bass and northern pike, so um, it's, it's multi-pronged uh, effort here that we can get. We're taking um, aging structures and then we'll take the lengths of each fish 
thankfully, uh, Wisconsin DNR, they'll take the, any of the aging structures and they'll age them over the winter. So it's uh, really a collaborative effort. Um, Rob Elliott from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, he comes up and he helps us with the cameras. So this is the sorting tank. And then where Jake is going to put the walleye is the downstream tube. So we don't pass anything upstream except for the lake sturgeon. Um, Jake will take the length and the aging structure and then back down um, the chute he'll go. And one of the benefits too and the cautions we take is we don't want to pass any aquatic invasive species above river. So right now it's only the lake sturgeon that gets passed and we make sure all of our gears uh, decontaminated before we do any of our operations and we make sure we don't pass any unhealthy looking sturgeon that might be sick um, or be carrying any type of a virus either. That's one of the priorities the implementation team really wanted to, uh, to press upon for our operations plan each year. Lake sturgeon are a threatened species in Michigan, and um, currently their population is probably 1% of what historically uh, their numbers were. They were in the millions pre-1850. Through many reasons, um, specifically um, habitat degradation through dams, also overfishing, it's caused the lake sturgeon to become imperiled. And their unique life history has made it even more complicated in the fact that uh, they have late maturation, um, meaning they don't spawn until they're much older than a typical fish. Females, they will generally uh, be ready to spawn between um, ages 20 and 30. Um, and the, the males, they generally are ready to spawn between eight and 12 years old. And so that late maturation kind of gives them one more uphill battle to face in trying to rehabilitate their populations. Currently, the Menominee River, it holds the largest population of lake sturgeon in all of Lake Michigan. So it's a pretty special spot for these fish. Unfortunately, there's five dams that are located between uh, here and Sturgeon Falls, and those are the historic range of um, lake sturgeon. And so what they're trying to do now is swim, migrate upstream, to um, those spawning habitats so they can spawn and increase the population for the next generation. So it's our job to try and pass those sturgeon up this dam and Park Mills. And so they have access to more spawning grounds. And specifically, even more importantly, is um, juvenile habitat for these lake sturgeon. Juvenile sturgeon require a lot more habitat, stream habitat. Um, they'd prefer maybe like 10 to 30 miles of stream habitat. And right now, below this dam, they only have two and a half miles. So it's really important for these fish to spawn above Menominee Dam and Park Mills Dam so they have access to the spawning grounds and those juvenile uh, rearing locations. And that's, that's huge and, and critical in this effort. Talking and, and planning um, for this whole project actually began in 2003. Um, there is what's called an implementation team, um, and that involves the uh, Michigan DNR, the Wisconsin DNR, um, the River Alliance of Wisconsin, and then we have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, North American Hydro, and of course Eagle Creek, uh, the owners of the dam. Uh, the Menominee Fish Passage, Menominee Park Mill Fish Passage, has been in development for over 15 years. It's been a cooperative effort through uh, the development and we're very proud to, to be able to perform this every year and help in the restoration of the habitat for the lake sturgeon. We all get together, uh, called the implementation team, and through um, many discussions and ideas, it came to be that um, they wanted to do a fish lift or a fish elevator to transport lake sturgeon uh, above the dam. And then fast forward to 2015, it was the first season that um, we actually ran the lift. That was in the, the spring of 2015. And we've been successful each season at, at passing Lake Sturgeon above this dam as well as Park Mills Dam. This is where the water actually comes in. Uh, right now we are above the Menominee Dam. Uh, water comes to the gate. And this is how I can alter the flow that um, is the attractant for the Lake Sturgeon. Uh, right now we are at 40 cubic feet per second. I can go to 75 and as high as 120 cubic feet per second. There's a metal gate that goes up and down and that's how it alters um, how fast the flow is going. 
So now the lift is running at its maximum capacity of 120 cubic feet per second. And hopefully that'll entice the lake sturgeon to come on in and we can get one for you. So another part of our job is to, um, to listen to see if there's any sturgeon that we've already tagged and sent downstream um, in the area. And so this is what this telemetry uh, unit is for. Uh, we're going to go out below the dam and listen to certain frequencies to see if I hear a clicking in the headphones that I'll be wearing. And if I do, then I'll record uh, the presence of that fish and the date and the time uh, of that fish as well. Okay, so I hear a beeping right now, and that's from fish 392. So I'll mark that down, uh, the date, the time, uh, the strength of the signal, and the weather. It's about 200 feet away that I'm able to hear if there's any sturgeon. I got another one, 442. So this is also part of the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point grad students research as well. We're helping them out a bit. There's a lot more fish right now because it's during the evening. The lake sturgeon are a lot more active at night, so that's why we do a lot of our studies at this time. The fish lift, the telemetry, um, they're, they're just more active at night. So I cycled through the whole um, frequencies that we've tagged, and there's four fish that are swimming within 200 feet of this area. So really interesting uh, and cool data that we collect here. Um, another part of what we're doing is working with University of Wisconsin and um, there's a grad student that wants to um, really analyze the best time um, for us to be running the lift. With, um, what's the best time to catch a lake sturgeon? Uh, how fast should the water be going? Should it be going 120 cubic feet per second or is 75 cubic feet per second? So, um, so we run and also how long do we run the, the lift for? So this one is going to be 15 minutes. Uh, we just did a lift for an hour, and then there's other instances where we run the lift for two hours and maybe a half hour. So it's varied right now for his, his study design. So right now I'm going to lower the lift uh, and I'm going to open the gate and we're going to fish the lift for 15 minutes. A um, great partnership that we've had is with Eagle Creek. Um, they've been pretty amazing at getting all the gear that we need to do our job, uh, whether it's waders or measuring board or nets. Um, they will provide it to us very quickly. They've been great partners. They've been very supportive of this effort, and uh, we definitely couldn't obviously have done it without them. To aid in the overall cost of constructing this fish passage, the implementation team applied for and received grant funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Three separate grants were awarded totaling $5.8 million. These funds were applied to the overall cost of the passage, which is approximately $12 million. Another grant was received from the Fund for Lake Michigan of $90,000 to be specifically utilized on the camera monitoring systems installed on both of the downstream passages and the fish lift. Hydroelectric generation is the oldest and most reliable form of renewable energy currently available to us. The first hydroelectric generating station in the world was built and operated in Appleton, Wisconsin in 1882. The primary opposition to hydroelectric generation has risen to prominence over recent decades and championed by environmentally minded groups. That being that dams are barriers to natural fish migration. The work being done at the Menominee River Fish Passage, specifically for the lake sturgeon, hopefully will advance the technologies available and the standing of hydroelectric generation as the cleanest and most reliable form of renewable energy currently available. And now, successfully promoting the migration and spawning of a threatened species while preventing the spread of invasive species up the Menominee River. Eagle Creek Renewable Energy is very thankful to our partners on the implementation team and the funding assistance received through the grants awarded. We are committed throughout our company to the production of clean renewable energy and responsible stewardship of the resources being utilized. Uh, 
Um, not all lake sturgeon get past that we capture. Um, they have to meet specific biological criteria. Specifically for like the, the females, they have to be around 50 inches and look into spawn in the next year. And how we verify that is usually with an ultrasound. Uh, you'll be able to see her eggs um, when we do that. Um, and then for males, they're usually 45 inches yep. um, or greater. And then with ultrasound too, you can tell that they're a mature male. 60.5 and 56. We really want the sturgeon to spawn for at least one season. Girth, 23.5 inches. The intention is for them to come back down and live their life out in the Great Lakes and then come back up and spawn when they're ready because sturgeon don't spawn every year. 422, 638, 2C, 6A. 05023 on the Floytag. Genetic sample. You want to move her for an ultrasound? So we're going to ultrasound her belly to uh, determine if she does indeed have eggs and she's ready to spawn in the next year. And if she is ready to spawn, we're going to pass her up this dam and Park Mills Dam. So hopefully she can swim up to Grand Rapids Dam and spawn like she's supposed to. You can see the eggs. They look like dots, kind of almost like oatmeal. Good eggs. She's ready to spawn. This lady is going upstream. So what we did, we just ultrasound a uh, female. Uh, we categorize her as an F4, which means she's going to be spawning in the next year. And so her next journey is to go uh, be trailered upstream past this dam and uh, Park Mills Dam. We go to a boat landing and we um, gurney them out um, on a sling and gently put them in the water and um, help them along and eventually they'll, they'll swim away. And within a very short period of time, they work their way all the way up until the next dam, which is Grand Rapids Dam. Um, and um, the female that we just um, examined, she will likely spawn uh, this April or May. And then come back down, hopefully, and we can record her on our bypasses, and um, she'll be going back down to the Great Lakes once again. So this sturgeon obviously isn't big enough. It doesn't meet the biological criteria for us to pass him upstream just quite yet. So what we did was we took his length, and we took his girth, and we pit tagged him, and we're gonna shoot him down the downstream water slide. He'll grow a little bit more, and hopefully we'll catch him again in future days. There he goes, back downstream. have a pink salmon so you know our main target is of course the lake sturgeon but of course every once in a while we'll get other species uh, the Chinook being one of them there's been multiple studies that have been looking at the sturgeon with this project we've put um, sonic tags in uh, 20 sturgeon each lift season and what that allows us to do is actually track where the sturgeon are going so it's great that we passed these um, sturgeon up two dams, but are they just coming right back down or are they actually staying up there to spawn for a season? So far the results are, are really promising. Uh, most of the sturgeon stay up there for at least one spawning period and they come back down. So we're actually not depleting the Great Lakes population that is uh, mainly here. They're coming back down and, and um, keeping those numbers where they should be. That study is ongoing. Those tags will work for 10 years, so it's going to give us huge amount of data. So um, once the, the lake sturgeon have their opportunity to spawn upstream uh, closer to the Grand Rapids Dam, uh, most of them come back down, they go through the dams, and we have actually two bypasses for them to use. One is at Park Mills and one is here. We have cameras located at both locations so we can see and verify if the sturgeon are in fact using that bypass. And so far, the, what we've seen for park mills, some of them actually have been using the bypass. So it's good to see. So right now, what you're looking at is the downstream bypass in the dams. Ideally, we'd like um, the lake sturgeon that we do pass up both dams to use these bypasses. And you can see the river goes through this, and it just goes downstream. A very simple idea. 
And we have three cameras in here now so we can monitor any fish that goes down into that uh, bypass. We've been passing these sturgeon for a few years now up uh, Minami Dam, Park Mills Dam. They swim rather quickly up to Grand Rapids Dam. They'll stay there, they'll spawn, and then they'll come down within a year generally. Um, they've been using the Park Mills bypass. Uh, we've seen that. And this one was just implemented. So hopefully with the cameras in place, we can uh, monitor and verify any sturgeon that are coming down the dams here. Since the spring of 2015, uh, we've captured uh, 220 lake sturgeon and we've passed upstream 104 lake sturgeon, not including this last fall. So far this last couple weeks, we've captured 34 sturgeon and we've passed up 24 sturgeon. So our annual goal to pass up is up to 90 sturgeon. And generally we want to keep uh, the ratio for uh, males and females um, five to one. So every five males we send up, we want to make sure we get one female to send up as well. We're doing it now in the fall, which runs about four weeks, uh, the month of October. And then come springtime, uh, generally in uh, April and into um, May, uh, we will run the lift for about eight weeks. And our goal again is the same, 45 lake sturgeon. It's never too early in the UP to start thinking snowmobiling. If you've got a vintage sled or two, you may want to stop in at the Long Branch Saloon in Faithorn on the 9th for the Vulcan Relic Riders Vintage Snowmobile Show and Swap Meet. The event starts at 9 a.m. Central Time. Snowmobile entry fee is only five bucks per sled, and you pay only for your first three entries. There's a dinner buffet and drinks available and live music after the show. On December 8th through the 10th, it's the TV6 Christmas Craft Show at the Superior Dome in Marquette. The annual event is put on by TV6 and features items handcrafted by each vendor. Find out more by visiting UpperMichiganSource.com. While you're in town, check out the Marquette Farmer's Market on December 9th between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Muzzle loader season runs from December 1st through the 10th. And the late archery season, as well as the rough grouse season, run from the 1st through January 1st. So good luck to all the hunters. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com, where you'll find the 906 Fishing Report, TV6 Weather, Shopping, and more. It's a great place to do your UP Christmas shopping. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. Mm -hmm.